But it, it is it's pure politics now. And, uh, of course, the president has been on both sides of this issue. But uh, I don't think the administration, you know, you'll have uh, Pompeo and Bolton and a few others that will be, uh, you know, guiding this. And it won't be good for Assange. That's true. And the attitude in the corridors of power now is not very good. In fact, Senator Manchin, uh, I think West Virginia, tweeted out this morning, quote, we own Assange, oh, which is uh, pretty disgusting. Uh, and uh, as you say, really, it is up to Trump, really. And, and, and it may come down to whether or not he is going to issue a pardon. He's on record probably 100 times in saying, I love WikiLeaks. He <laughs> said it in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania during the campaign. But the problem is all Trump's people, all of his top people want Assange dead. Uh, in fact, literally. Uh, and this goes to number one, Pence. He was actually in Ecuador last year. Uh, of course, the Ecuadorians, they want a big IMF loan. We need some money. Uh, the, the, the president who gave Assange asylum uh, was replaced by a president who wants to make a deal. So Pence went over there and made a deal. Hey, cancel As uh, Assange's asylum and you'll get your IMF loan. And, of course, he bit on it. Pompeo, of course, he was a CIA director back in 2017 when he gave a, an unbelievable speech at CSIS. Here's a couple of things he said. And, in fact, we had Assange himself at our conference that summer where he talked about these quotes. Uh, Pompeo said, WikiLeaks is a non-state hostile intelligence often abetted by state actors like Russia. To give them the space to crush us with misappropriated secrets is a perversion of what our great constitution stands for. It ends now. Boy. Very chilling. S scary stuff. You know, uh, Ellsberg did not have to go to prison, and he, in a way, won. Uh, except he won on a technicality on the way the proceedings go. So this, this means that Assange needs the best attorneys uh, available. And at least back then, they were willing to be judicious enough that if they were breaking the rules in the process, that uh, they couldn't convict him under those circumstances. But uh, whatever that, that can be done, but I'm sure, I'm sure he needs money for his attorneys and yeah. everything else. And I'm, I bet it's not difficult to find out how you can directly help him. But I think the, pub, the public pressure is the most important thing to, to talk to, uh, to our representatives. Because if they think nobody cares, they're not going to care. And uh, right now, I have no good feeling for uh, how Congress would even come down on this. I think, I think uh, right now my estimate would be, from my experience here, would be whatever is safe, yeah, <laughs> whatever yeah. is politically safe, which means that they need to hear noise. They need to hear noise, and they better not say, yeah, we have to vote to extradite them and do this and try them and do all these things. But uh, they should realize that it isn't automatically politically safe to just pile on and say, well, he, he committed you know, treason and he's disloyal to the United States and all these, all these arguments and, uh, and forget about seeking out the truth. Well, here's the problem. Here's why he's going to have a hard time finding uh, anyone in Washington, because he told the truth. And telling the truth hurts the state. He hurt the state by showing what the U.S. was doing. We weren't liberating Iraq. We were killing a bunch of innocent people. The policy was horrible, and we did terrible things. The state doesn't like that. It challenges the state. So this is when both sides, as you talk about, they'll come together and they'll have a bipartisan <laughs> reaction, because that's the thing they fear the most. You know, things were going fairly well because he was, uh, had been declared a citizen and he was allowed to be in the embassy. And then there was an election in Ecuador. And the uh, president then was more friendly. And then there was an election, of, believe it or not, Lenin, Lenin Moreno. Yeah. And he's anti-Assange. He's the one that flipped the table. But so without knowing, so I shouldn't say this without knowing, but I suspicious that Moreno might be uh, have been influenced by the United States government. Yeah. I'd like to have somebody go back and check up on that election. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned we've, we've dealt with Assange's team, his legal team and others, and, and you know, they, they, they do a very good job. And so I, I, I would just echo what you said about people wanting to support them to get him the best, uh, the best uh, representation he can have. But the other thing, Dr. Paul, that people might be wondering, and I was wondering at first, really, is what comes next. And I think what comes next, as our... Uh, as our subtitle suggests, is a show trial. And this is classic, and it's disturbing because it really echoes the Soviet show trials of the 50s. And I would actually encourage our viewers, if you haven't read uh, Arthur Kussler's Great Darkness at Noon, that will tell you exactly what a show trial is like. What's the purpose of a show trial is not to convict someone of a crime. 
The purpose of a show trial is to tell the rest of the people in the country, don't you dare do anything like this person did, or you're going to get it. That's the purpose. First, you have to obfuscate what he actually did. We're already seeing that, Dr. Paul. They say it's not about press freedom. It's about hacking. They were hacking. That's the illegal part. They want to obfuscate what he did. Then they want to demonize him to the public. That's an important phase. Uh, they'll, put, they'll put out more salacious details, sexual embarrassing details. I bet they'll put out some financial impropriety to divide people against him. That's important. And then at the end, when all this is done, there can only be one verdict. You know, and I, I have a good friend of mine who lived in, in Albania during communism, and he told me how the trials go. And of course, this is exactly what they do. And at the very end, the people's prosecutor says, I'm sorry, the comrades have all said, the people have said you're guilty. How can I rule against the people? <laughs> and that's exactly what we're going to see here. And it's, uh, it's really disturbing and disgusting. Well, there's, there's one thing we don't have to worry about. And this, this is a positive. There is a setting of an example uh, by uh, Assange as well as Chelsea Manning. And that is the tradition in a show trial is they work real hard on signed confessions. And uh, then they go ahead, yes, you've signed it, you've confessed, and you think that's going to help them get off and uh, be excused? No, that's usually when they go ahead and, and do the final final solution. Yeah. And this final solution could be life in prison. Uh, so so they, they, I wouldn't be surprised, but we don't have to worry about it. Assange is not going to sign that. After all this he's gone through, yeah. he's oh, yeah, I did this, I did this, and I'll do this, get me off. And it looks like this Chelsea Manning has courage, too. Yeah, and you think back it, to jail. I mean, she's back in jail because they wanted to use her in helping us set this stage where they can use her testimony against Assange. So I would say if we're looking for some positive look for the positive character traits of these two individuals because one thing for sure they're going to stick to their guns um, and the one thing that we can be sure is that the most of the prosecution uh, will be sticking to their guns of ignoring the rule of law and that uh, they're going to march ahead and not really consider a fair trial you know this is this is the whole thing uh, they're they're going to extradite it uh, extradite him here to the United States to get a, a, a f fair trial. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's uh, that's sort of a mockery of what what should be done of having a, a, a trial in the land of the home and the free of the brave. Because yeah. um, we, we just these recent events, the last couple years of this, all this uh, election scandal and how the FBI was used and the Justice Department. I mean, no, people have lost confidence and. If, if this contributes to the loss of confidence, this is a benefit because people shouldn't be overconfident. They should understand how our system works. And it shouldn't be saying, you know, let's say somebody was unfairly treated overseas or there was a controversy. And, well, he, he wants, he's a good American and he's going to get an American trial. I want to come home or I want to go to America. They're known to have fair trials. But I don't think, I don't think our reputation is like that now. That might be the last place Assange wants to go. Yeah. He might pick almost any country uh, over being tried in this country. It's very sad, very sad. And, you know, I think, uh, as Dr. Paul said, you know, the free press is not the only thing under attack. Free speech is not the only thing under attack. Really, it's our own minds that are under attack, our own perceptions, the way we uh, can receive and process information. If learning the truth about what our government does is illegal, then we have no way of challenging. Then we truly live in a complete totalitarian system where not only do we not oppose the government, we can't even think outside the box. So I would just echo what Dr. Paul says. If you've ever considered contacting your representatives respectfully, contacting the, the White House respectfully, writing letters, alerting your friends, this is going to take a sustained effort, not just a day or two, a sustained effort. People in the streets demonstrating in favor of Assange. This is our own future. This is our own country that's at stake. And so we have to take this very seriously. Very good. And, and as bad as it is, uh, we, we still have some options. We still do have freedoms. We still have these programs. We still can uh, speak out. Uh, we still have the internet. 
even with the shortcomings. And I was overly optimistic about the Internet because it's not smooth sailing, but it's available. We still get information out over the Internet. So we, we can look at it and say that something is available. It's better than when we only had three major networks and we got everything from the major network. So we have to keep pounding away to get information out because that is the only thing. Truth uh, truth is the imper- important issue. And I think that the American people are ripe for it. Just having gone through these last two or three years of this nonsense with the FBI and the judicial system, people ought to say, you know, there's something wrong with this. And what is it? Maybe we should look at this more carefully. And there is a reason why we should have all Americans looking at this case more carefully if they think it's important that the American people People can speak out and that the people who report and print it and write and get on TV and Internet, they have to be protected because remember first, the First Amendment to the Constitution was the right of free speech and talking to people and assembly. So that is key. And I always believe that was a great positioning of that amendment, because if we can't talk and we get put in prison for talking, even if it's imperfectly, you know, this uh, th- that's bad news. So we'd like to stop the bad news and turn this around and make a good news and activate and energize people who need to get this information out. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon. So, so that's a, that's a very interesting development. But let's let's look at the broader picture here. Uh, let's let's drill down to uh, Julian Assange himself, WikiLeaks themselves. Uh, what what is the big issue here? Uh, under threat, uh, presumably by the United States. Uh, the the thought behind this that the reason why people are concerned is that if he is turfed out onto the pavement of Belgravia in London, uh, that he would then be apprehended by British authorities who would be exercising an old uh, ar- arrest warrant for uh, skipping bail in 2010. And at that point, he would be rendered, handed over, if you will, uh, to the United States in an, some sort of extradition process between the U.S. and Britain, where he would be uh, facing uh, some sort of trial or criminal charges in the United States for I, I'm not sure exactly for what, but uh, I would assume it'd be under the uh, Espionage Act of 1917. But um, it, it, maybe you can, you know, simplify this story a little bit for us. Well, it's almost certain that he would be arrested by the British authorities once he steps out of that embassy. He's protected there in the embassy under the Vienna Convention. The British police cannot enter that sovereign territory. Uh, as Assange once pointed out, even if Britain were at war with Ecuador, they're not allowed to enter the embassy in London. So he's protected by international law, which is why they don't really want to expel him, because it would be an obvious violation of international law that is not uh, enforced, unfortunately, by anybody. It could only be the UN Security Council, and the U.S. would veto any attempt to protect Assange there. So, over an international law issue. However, politically and image-wise, uh, the both the Ecuadorian government and the uh, British embassy cannot, British uh, public, uh, police perhaps, uh, cannot go into the embassy and get him, and they can't expel him very easily. So they're trying to force him out by making his life hell. We learned that from this piece uh, a week ago by Cassandra Fairbanks, that they are subjecting him to body searches, full scans within the embassy. They're making his life a living hell, trying to force him out, and he's withstanding this. He's not leaving. So they want to get him out because he would then be arrested by the British police. The British Defense Secretary said months ago that he would get a warm welcome from the British police if he should leave and step onto British territory again, and he would then face extradition almost certainly by the United States, a request that would go to the British courts. They could try to tie it up as long as possible. But if he were to be extradited to the United States, he would be appearing in a courtroom here in Alexandria, where I am, and face uh, charges that we know exist because the United States government inadvertently revealed that he has been charged. The assumption is it's under the Espionage Act. However, no journalist or publisher has ever been prosecuted successfully anyway under Section E of the Espionage Act. And that Section E says that anyone who has mere possession and or disseminates classified information violates the Espionage Act that does not protect journalists as well. So any reporter, any publisher, any editor who has classified information, even possessing them, is not authorized to have it and then disseminates it, could be charged under the Espionage Act. But that has never been done because of the political implications of doing that. It appears to conflict with the First Amendment. Uh, 
of the United States Constitution, which, depending on Paper's case, showed really only applies to prior restraint. In other words, before publication, the government cannot tell someone, a newspaper, a radio station, a TV station, a magazine, anyone, a website, that they are not allowed to publish this. They cannot do that. However, after publication, they are liable to prosecution under this Section E of the, of the Espionage Act. Now, there has been a magazine called The Masses in 1918 that was prosecuted under the Espionage Act, but under a different section that dealt with the draft, mm -hmm. with impeding the military draft. That's not what we're dealing with here. There was an attempt after the uh, Pentagon Papers case, uh, because the majority of the Supreme Court said that they could prosecute after publication. In fact, the uh, Boston grand jury, federal grand jury, was impaneled to try to uh, prosecute two New York Times reporters for publishing the Pentagon Papers, but that collapsed when the Ellsberg trial also collapsed because of prosecutorial misconduct. So it is that would be a groundbreaking uh, historic case to, uh, uh, to prosecute Julian Assange, a publisher, under this section just for having and disseminating classified information. It would have a wide implication for any journalistic outfit that does the same so what it appears to do be happening is the government wants to get him on a conspiracy charge conspiracy to commit espionage with chelsea manning in other words they're going to try to prove that julian assange and or wikileaks encouraged or explained how chelsea manning could get access to these classified data and they want her to testify again in this grand jury to apparently implicate Assange or WikiLeaks in this act of actually stealing the cables, the State Department cables and the Iraq and Afghan war logs. She testified in her trial that she did it all on her own and she has takes full responsibility. She was jailed for 35 years. Obama commuted her sentence after seven years. She's free and then she was subpoenaed to testify against Assange in this ongoing grand jury in Alexandria. She refused. On principle, she's against grand juries, and she also said that political activists have been railroaded in grand juries to implicate people, and she won't do it. So she's sitting in a jail cell still for four weeks, refusing to testify. So it appears they don't have everything they need to get him on the Espionage Act in the uh, – not in the – actually under the act where he's possessing classified information, although they could technically get him on that, but politically it's not uh, a wise decision to do that. So they want to get him a looks like on the conspiracy with Manning, and she's just refusing to testify. And that's where we are right now in terms of the legal case. Mm -hmm. So so you've, uh, you mentioned a couple of those uh, amendments to the uh, 19, uh, mm. 1917 Espionage Act, Section E. That would have been, I guess, the 1950 uh, am amendment. No, yeah. that that was in the original act. What oh, was amended are... was in 1961, they made it a global treaty. The original Espionage Act only uh, made someone liable for prosecution if they committed this act of alleged espionage on U.S. territory or on the high seas. And it was extended to the entire world because people say, well, how could Assange, who's an Australian and Ecuadorian citizen, not an American, who's publishing from outside the United States, who is currently living in the UK, how could U.S. law apply to him? And that's because of this 1961 amendment. And that was a case where a State Department official in the, in the Poland was blackmailed by Polish intelligence. They took photos of him in bed with another woman, and uh, he then gave up documents that the Polish security agencies wanted from the u.s embassy and he was found to be not was a he was not able to be charged under the espionage act because this act even though he was an american took place outside u.s territory so this congressman had the law changed and now it applies to everybody anywhere in the world so that's how assange could be still liable under the espionage act because of that amendment 1961 Mm -hmm. Wow. So so now if 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 this is the case, if he is extradited, if this does happen, uh, if this if the grand jury uh, process is the process that's that's going to be used, I, I would assume, Joe, that uh, you, you probably know more about grand, grand juries than I do. It's not my uh, specialty, but I would say it's not as transparent as a normal uh, jury trial or normal. Uh, it's completely secret, Patrick. 
Right. And that's a problem here, B- Joe, because if you think about what's at stake with the public interest, this could be a defining precedent for uh, all press, all media, f- from First Amendment uh, publishers, whistleblowers, sources that to, to be done in secret. Uh, this is a huge injustice, potentially, if that's oh, no, no question. Well, as I said, Chelsea Manning thinks that the jury system, grand jury system itself is unjust. There's only one other country, apparently, in the world that still has a grand jury, and that's Liberia. United States and Liberia. Now, the, the problem with the grand jury is that there is it's completely secret, so the public is not there. <clears throat> there is no defense attorney. There is only a prosecutor and a jury, and the prosecutor is trying to convince this jury that he has enough evidence to indict or formally accuse someone. So it's not a conviction, but an, a formal accusation. Mm-hmm. Now, the uh, there was an interesting piece in the Washington Times last week that laid out what a possible strategy of Chelsea Manning's lawyers. They are arguing that if, in fact, this indictment has already been uh, written and is under seal, the one that was inadvertently leaked because part of it was pasted into someone, a completely unrelated criminal case that was then published, and there are two paragraphs. The second one says, Mr. Assange has been charged. So the there was a there was a court hearing to try to unseal that, and it was unsuccessful. So it is still a sealed indictment. Now, Chelsea Manning's lawyers are arguing, if there is already an indictment, the questioning of Manning now is not towards an indictment, but could be used in some way by the government in a trial if Assange were to be arrested and put on trial. And that would be illegal. You, she, they could not take testimony from Manning in a grand jury setting, which is supposed to remain secret, and use that in a later on in a trial where, in other words, Manning not having counsel present, she cannot get advised, and there is nobody in from the public to observe the proceedings, that whatever she says in there is supposed to remain sealed forever. Uh, it's not evidence. It's uh, part of the argument of the indictment is based, of course, on the grand jury testimony, but they cannot reveal what that testimony is, which is, by the way, it relates to Russiagate, because when Mueller in- indicted the GRU agents, that indictment is not evidence. It's just an ac- accusation, mm-hmm. and they can't reveal a lot of what they uh, learned from the grand jury, and though the American press, of course, kept saying that uh, Russia had hacked, uh, as if this was a conviction. But anyway, this is where we are, where Manning is refusing to testify, um, and it, either they don't have enough to indict, or they're trying to trick her into using stuff that they could later use at trial in a way, and that is why uh, she still remains in jail, and Assange is in his own kind of jail, and we're back to square one now, <clears throat> because this leak from the Ecuadorian government to WikiLeaks seems to have stopped the expulsion and arrest of Assange, at least for the moment. <coughs> So, so my my thoughts were, Joe, that um, uh, under normal uh, conditions, it would be very hard. I mean, some whoever the judges that would rule against uh, WikiLeaks and, and not not as a hostile foreign intelligence agency, which is the rhetoric coming out of the State Department, uh, no, but as, as a publisher, uh, this would have far-reaching, sweeping implications uh, for what is one of the fundamental pillars of the United States uh, Constitutional Republic, uh, ha- having a viable fourth estate and protection, even protections of uh, whistleblowers have some rights uh, uh, under under the U.S. Constitution. It would be hard to find a judge uh, that would want that on their uh, on their legacy. But there is one court, uh, which you probably are aware of. I heard John Kiriakou talk. Yep. About this during one of your vigil uh, videos just a couple of days ago, this one single court in uh, northeastern Virginia, I, I think, and one single judge uh, ruling on every single one of these cases and always ruling in favor of the state, basically. Um, do you know anything about that? Yeah, I've been in courtroom 700 at the Alexandria Federal Courthouse. It's a 10-minute drive from where I am, where I live. I've been in that court. I've seen Leonie Brinkham, and she's the judge. She has taken all these cases onto herself. I was in the courtroom when the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press was uh, arguing for the unsealing of that indictment that was inadvertently revealed by the government. So I've seen her in action. She's extremely thorough, and she and you knew which, how she was going to rule. She took about two months, and she finally ruled, of course, in the favor of the government, that they never actually ad- have admitted that this indictment exists formally, so therefore, it, since we don't know if it exists or not, I cannot unseal it, order it unsealed. And she gave a bunch of other reasons, being you cannot unseal before arrest because it could help the suspect to uh, to uh, escape. Now, the last thing Julian Assange wants to do is escape from 
the uh, embassy or to you know, walk out the front door. He's purposely staying there. They know where he is. Uh, they can get him out. That's what they're trying to do. And so the idea that the an, uh, revealing an indictment beforehand would give him a chance to walk out the front door was, is, is absurd. So that is the courtroom. If he winds up in court, uh, he's, John is probably very likely true, right by saying that that's where Assange would be tried in that very courtroom, courtroom 700. And there's all kinds of tricks, of course, the government could use to prevent discovery on the part of Assange's lawyers. Um, <clears throat> for example, if they uh, demand some information that's classified, the government could tell Breonna Lincoln, uh, sorry, Judge Brinkema, who most likely has clearance all the time, to go into her courtroom and say, oh, we cannot reveal this, it's classified. And she can come out and say, well, that's ruled out, you can't have that evidence. And then if you keep doing that, it becomes a very slanted case in a very slanted courtroom and a way to put somebody away without them actually having a legitimate defense. So there's all kinds of peril that Assange would face if he were to be arrested and sent to the U.S. It's almost certain that he would be convicted. And, and Dan Ellsberg has said this numerous times and sent away for the rest of his life, maybe a lot of it in solitary confinement, which is why Julian Assange is clinging to that embassy as bad as his life has become there um there's still a, a glimmer of hope that he could somehow get out and it would be a lot have to do with the public reaction media human rights organizations average citizens protesting speaking out we're doing our part with this vigil online and uh, this is the only way public pressure on the various governments involved ecuador the u.s and uk to not let this uh, go forward to the scenario I just sketched out where he winds up in solitary confinement for the rest of his life. So, so you, you just highlighted something really important, Joe, is that there's two sides uh, even to the uh, – well, you have the legal side and you have the, the, the chess game going on there, which you've laid out quite a few of the moves, uh, which likely moves by, by the government in the United States and a lot of the games and, and legal brinksmanship and lawfare uh, there to sort of corner uh, Julian Assange and to manipulate due process. On the other side of that, Joe, you have what you just highlighted there, which is the public opinion or the public reaction side, which is very important. And I think that uh, the uh, the U.S. media, the press, the establishment have done a great job in demonizing uh, Julian Assange under the sort of banner of Russiagate. But there seems to be an opportunity now, now that the, uh, the Mueller report has come back uh, as a sort of donut hole. Uh, and Russiagate, the narrative has collapsed. With that, the sort of, uh, well, you still have the DNC uh, hacking uh, allegations and that side of the WikiLeaks story, but but they've done a good job demonizing Julian Assange, uh, almost tying him to the enemy du jour, which is Russia, okay? So very little in terms of uh, public sympathy for Assange, very little outcry from the, the political left, uh, that would normally be defending him on this issue, but there's, you're saying that there is a chance to rebound uh, on this on this public support issue. Well, the intelligence agencies were always against him. Obviously, going back to the earliest days of WikiLeaks, particularly after the 2010 leaks of the Afghan and Iraq war logs and the State Department cables by Manning, and it is under those I should point out that uh, the indictment of Assange is taking place, not anything he did in Russia, the, the Russia Gate story. So there shouldn't be a confusion there. But at the time that those stories came out, even though the intelligence agencies were uh, against him and wanted to stop him, the liberal media in the U.S. gave ample coverage to these uh, revelations because they exposed crimes of the Bush administration, Republican. So there was a partisan point of view right away that went against the intelligence agencies at that point. And the press, you know, trumpeted WikiLeaks and feted him and he won awards and he spoke uh, in numerous places. Uh, he was at the TED Talks, I mean, and he got standing ovation there. So in very mainstream venues, uh, Assange was feted as a successful journalist and publisher by journalists. And uh, his, pub his revelations were published far and wide. And it was only the intelligence agencies that were angered. But when it came to the 2016 election and he published the emails of Hillary Clinton and by the way uh, he is on camera in that film Risk by Laura Poitras saying you could uh, she films him at various important points in his saga and he, he's on the phone to someone saying uh, uh, we have some really good Clinton documents unfortunately we don't have anything 
from Trump. There might be something, but we don't. Unfortunately, so he would have published Trump stuff if he had it, mm-hmm. but he only published Clinton stuff. And that, of course, incensed the Democrats and the so-called uh, left uh, progressives, uh, the liberals and the liberal media. They went against him. And, of course, the intelligence agency was saying, wow, that's great. Finally, we have the dominant liberal media on our side because they're going after their, her, their, their champion and their queen, Hillary Clinton. And that's when we got this alliance between liberal media and the intelligence agencies to really demonize Assange. And, and Russia, of course, and link them together. The whole collusion narrative, which we now know, which is absolutely, well, we knew that, people like you and me, Patrick, from the very beginning, we were writing and saying this, that it was a, a completely made up story, the collusion. So that has now been confirmed that it was made up, but they start to demonize him for partisan reasons, and that hasn't changed yet. So um, there's got to be uh, the, the end of the collusion narrative, put obviously a real a hole into their argument. But it's not over yet. They still think that Russia hacked, and they still think that Assange uh, was working with Russia to publish those emails. And their lady, Hillary, was still hurt, and they lost the election, and they're still blaming Assange for having played a role in that. Uh, So we're not completely out of that yet. But when we're talking about the vast majority of the public that is not plugged into this story, that if they understood a simple principle here, that Assange is on their side not on the side of the state. He's on the side of the people knowing what people in the state are doing secretly, that a criminal activity, corruption, and certainly hurts the interests of the vast majority of the American people. He's doing the job journalism is supposed to do, which is to defend the people against government malfeasance and mispractice and crimes and corruption. And the established media is not doing nearly a good enough job exposing that. And because they have been succumbed to the partisan uh, point of view, which they're not supposed to have as a journalist, supposed to be independent and protect the people against the government. And they're not doing that. And Assange is doing that. Somehow the people have to be made to understand that and they could come forward and defend him and put pressure on governments. Now, obviously, when the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Privacy Rights uh, releases at the very same day, that was Friday, the day after this warning that was given to the WikiLeaks, and WikiLeaks posted online that his expulsion was imminent. When the UN comes out with a document like that, saying that we're going to go see him on April 25th, uh, that's really important in terms of the response of Ecuador and the U.S. government to what's going on. But that there has to be the public pushing behind this. Uh, otherwise, these governments will get away with the kind of stuff that were revealed in WikiLeaks releases, 